Okay, let's just bow our heads in prayer. Father God, I pray, Lord, as we look at your word, uh, I pray that you'll cause us to understand it, and not only understand it, Lord, with the boldness from your spirit, let us proclaim it to others, Lord, that they would know your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you cannot believe the amount of People are panicking at the moment because they haven't read um, Bible prophecy in so long and they've never read it or answered certain questions and so they are saying things from their guts, right? You know, what they think it is. Now, I know that myself because when I was younger, before I studied the, try to work out the rapture and I had to work out every meaning of every particular theme, I had to learn the day of the Lord. And when I read the day of the Lord, there are about 20 descriptions, some parts there'll be six, it'll link up with somebody else, add another three, add another two, and there's about 20 of them. And, um, and then when I got it, I realized it, I realized that what I had thought in just re not studying that theme, but just by reading a bit, I thought I had the gist of the day of the Lord, but you can know it exactly. You can know it to the extent where someone gets up and talks about uh, the topic and you go, no, that's not it, sorry. This is, it's not, that's not one of, there's 20 descriptions, I'll show them to you. You, um, where's your description? that you just said there. So it's, it's common for all of us, you, 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 because we hear things, we have, uh, you know, your first Christian, you'll hear th other Christians talking, you think you know what they're talking about, but you don't until you actually sit down and study it. And, you know, like I, someone uh, very important, a person whose father has been a very important figure in Australia uh, in uh, church circles, it's pretty well known, and he, uh, his daughter came up to me and <clears throat> she wanted to bait the rapture and she doesn't know, she doesn't understand it. She's, even if you show her a point, she can't grasp it because she's never thought about it. And she, I turned around and I said, uh, the denomination her father's in, I said, um, they've, um, you know, half of them uh, no longer believe in the rapture. And she said, that's not true. And I went on and um, said, yes, it is. And then I mentioned a few guys. I said, they no longer believe. And she said, I spoke to him two years ago. She never spoke to him about end times, right? She just spoke to him. Hi, how are you going? Right? And so what happens is she thought she was bluffing and and, and then she said, oh yeah, they're kingdom now. And I didn't get a chance to say it because the race started, it was a um, uh, cross country. And I turned around and I said, um, uh, but I meant to say it, if I next, uh, next time I say it, I just, I won't even debate anymore. I'll say, you've got a misconception of, she knows all the sons of God that have jumped over to kingdom now and, and Hillsong and all that. And you're gonna say, now don't take my word for it, go on the net and type in Kingdom Now's rejection of a two-part resurrection. See, they have a resurrection right at the end. They don't have an Armageddon. They don't have Mark of the Beast. They don't have all of this. And so, um, you know, they're panicking now because everyone can see things, the world, God shaking the world. Then you've got other people who do, but they've never, they had a good handle of it like we all did when we were younger, 
but not a specific handle of it. And they're making, there are so many people, pastors, AOG pastors, other pastors who say, where do you think we are? What, what, uh, where in the last seven years are we? I said, we're not in the last seven years, right? And you, you have to show them. So um, this, what we're about to see is the reason why nobody knows nothing, okay? And we'll turn to Jeremiah 23, and we're going to exegete this. I went over this the other day, and I just thought, wow, this has to be proclaimed again. So let's have a look at it. And we'll read what it says. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who fed my peoples, you have scattered my flock, driven them away and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doing, says the Lord. But I'll gather the remnant of the flock of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds and they shall be fruitful and, and increase and I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them and they will fear no more nor be dismayed nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. I'll just go on a f further, verse 9. It says, my heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man and like a man whom wine has overcome because of the Lord and because of his holy words. For the land is full of adulterers. For because of a curse, the land mourns. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up. Their course of life is evil and their might is not right. Both For both prophet and priest are profane yet in my house I have found their wickedness says the Lord okay now we're just going to break this down break it down completely and understand that we're going to look for the time frame then we're going to look for the time frame okay yep yep Yep, yep, yep. No, it's, it's okay, Paul. I've been criticised all my life. You know, it's okay. It's all right. Is there a, I, I say to my wife, is there a decision I can make that's ever right? <laughs> <laughs> so you've got the time frame. The next thing we've got uh, the uh, players, who is mentioned here, right? And then we'll get into some of the rest of the stuff that's there. But we'll do the time frame first. Now, the first thing is with the Bible. The Bible, the prophets prophesied for three periods of time, their own, the first coming of Jesus, the second coming. Sometimes it's specific to uh, the first coming, sometimes it's specific to the second coming. Um, so a lot of times they're combined, right? Like unto us a son is given. That's the first uh, coming of Jesus. And the government will be upon his shoulders. That's after the second coming, right? They, they apply to both, okay? Now, the time frame for this, yes, it had the first and second coming, but this is specific for the end times. The reason why? I'll give you four reasons. The first is, it says in verse 5, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I'll raise to David a branch of righteousness, a king shall reign and prosper, and execute judgment and righteousness in the, the earth. This is talking about the millennial reign when Christ returns. In his days Judah will be saved, Israel will dwell selfly. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore God says the days are coming that the Lord shall no longer say as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I had driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. The Bible prophesies about two diasporas. Diasporas were when the Jews are scattered uh, big massacre, big war, massacre. They scattered, they're scattered all around. The first one was in Babylon and they were there for 70 years and they came back to their land. 
okay? This one is talking about the second diaspora when they were cast all over the world after uh, two massacres by Roman emperors. And what happened is they, um, uh, uh, when that happened, uh, the Jews did not have a land of Israel for 1,800 years. Now, when they returned, if you want to take verse 7 to 8 and take it to Jeremiah, same book, verse 16, uh, 13 to 16, you'll see an extended version of it, and it's talking about the second diaspora because it's word for word, okay? So it's just an excerpt from it, and it's word for word. The only people who would really understand that are people who've seen Israel come back into the land and be kicked out again, right? Okay, they'd already been kicked out at this time, at the first one. Jeremiah prophesied about the Babylonian captivity. So there's the first one. Verse 15, is it 15? Yes. He's talking to the prophets and he says, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I'll feed them with wormwood and make them drink bitter waters. Okay, well, we know that is the judgment from Revelation 8. Okay, both of those. And then we go to um, verse 19. He says, Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent whirlwind. whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. <coughs> now, in the Bible, the whirlwind is the judgment of God. The tempest is the judgment of God. The fury is the judgment of God. The anger is the judgment of God. And the wrath is the God, uh, judgment of God, okay, on these people. Now, in verse 20, it's so obvious it's not funny. It says, The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly, right? In the latter days, you'll understand it perfectly, right? People could understand to a certain level in their day, but we would grasp it completely, right? In our, because we ha, we see everything in hindsight. Okay. Now, uh, the first player we have is the shepherds. The next uh, player we have is the flock. The next player we have the remnant flock. The next player we have are the uh, uh, prophets. The next one is the priests. And the next one is the dreamers. Okay? Now, this has a dual application. It refers to the nation of Israel, right? It, they are kicked out and scattered all over the world. But when Christians are hurt in churches and disillusioned, they go from place to place looking for a safe haven, someone which will preach. It has a dual application in when it's being spoken of. Now, the first thing it says to these is, woe. Now, this is not talking, this is talking about uh, shepherds of God's flock, okay, God's flock, okay, and it's not, um, uh, it's not talking about outside the church, it's talking inside the church, it says here, um, in, we read it before, it says, um, I've seen it in my house, so I've just got to go back and find it, verse 11, for both prophet and priest are profane, yes, in my house, I have found their wickedness. It's inside the church of God, right? So it's not saying Jehovah Witnesses or something like this. It's talking about what's happening in the church. Woe means they're going to be judged, okay? Now, for the believer, their judgment, their final judgment, uh, was already done on Calvary. We suffer judgment for the things we do that are wrong in a practical way. They, we call them consequences. So if I'm rude to people, I don't have any friends, right? If I'm demanding on people, people go, oh, I've got to get away from this guy, right, like this, or this girl, 
okay? That's the way it works, right? There are judgments on everything. If uh, a man is, uh, doesn't discipline his children, they'll come back to bite him on the bottom, right? It'll, uh, everything is consequence. They're judgments, right? They're judgments for uh, not being diligent and humble to apply God's word to your life. See, it's not about saying, oh, yeah, I know that verse. It's do you apply it to your life, right, okay? So these guys are in deep trouble, okay? The next one is the flock. They're going to be scattered, right? And then the remnant flock are going to be brought back and restored not everyone is going to be brought back and restored, right? Okay? Um, the remnant flock are brought back and restored and given real shepherds. The, both prophets and uh, priests are profane. Anything profane, God kicks, right? Gone. Okay? There's no mucking around. The prophets... We're told, we're going to read it, speak from their own mind. And then the dreamers make people, take people away from the word of God. And we'll go through it slowly. Take the flock from the word of God. Okay, now, going to the first thing, it says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastor, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, against the shepherds who feed my people, you have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I'll attend to you for the evil of your doings. Right, now, when he says that, that is an overview an overview. We have to compare other verses on the same topic in the same time period, right? Ezekiel 34, we have the same, but it elaborates. It's more specific on this. So we go to um, Ezekiel 34, reading from verse 1. Okay, Ezekiel 34. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Their focus is on their ministry, their life. Right? Their life. Um, should, not, uh, should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and close yourselves with the wool. Their lifestyle, right? Okay, and it's in very important. We want to eat the fat, right? The fat was given as a sacrifice to God. The Christian life is a sacrifice. All these money preachers who say we're supposed to be getting the best of everything, we get the best in the kingdom, right? That's when we get the best. We are not to do that. The Christian life was shown in many different ways as an example with the Jews that our life is sacrificial and not everything is uh, allowed to us. We don't have the freedom to have them. The Jews were given dietary laws, Right? They were given dietary laws. Now, people today are trying to go back to eating dietary laws. You've got so many Christians who are vegans and all these things. Some want to go back to the Garden of Eden when they were vegans and, or, you know, or vegetarians. I don't know the categories how you, you're talking, but vegetable eaters, okay? <laughs> right? Okay, veggie eaters, okay? So this is what they want to take us back. 
right? Then you've got other people who say, I want to eat what God says to eat in the Bible. There's a purpose. He done it to do, for a couple of reasons, right? The first reason is it was in, as an example that to really follow God, we sacrifice pleasures in this life. Like I can sit there and go to Club Med every year, right, okay? You go to Club Med every year, but the money I use for Club Med, another person would use it for the move, uh, for, yeah, they still have their holidays, but they wouldn't be so extravagant. And they'd use it for India or places like that, whatever country God ever puts on your heart, for the proclamation of the gospel. So some of the dainties of life, we don't have. The second reason he did it, he did do it for physical reasons, for health reasons, because he, uh, we don't, they didn't have the level of science that we have today. Now, Christians are allowed to eat pigs, full stop, right? We're allowed to eat bacon and we're allowed to eat pork and whatever, but there was, the Jews couldn't use it. But at the time they didn't use it, they were, those pigs in those days, they didn't understand they have to be grain fed, yeah. right? They, di they didn't know they had to be grain fed. And pigs are awful eaters. Like it, everyone laughs about this, but this is a reality. You go to remote places in Thailand and you go off in the bush to go to the toilet, you've got to take a stick with you because the pigs will follow you out. And when you go to the toilet, they will be fighting behind your bottom to who's going to get it. It's, it's, that's what it's like. And so when the pigs eat offal, what happens is they, when they eat offal, they get a certain amount of cysts in the body, which becomes dangerous to humans when they eat it. The next thing you weren't able to eat was shellfish. Now, uh, there's no Filipinos here today, but if you go to the Philippines, ask them to explain what red tide is. Everyone knows it in Asia, and it's when uh, the water temperature is so high that it causes oysters and shellf all shellfishes to, go to, to have too much bacter certain bacteria. The bacteria is always there, but in small amounts it doesn't matter. Same as the, with the pigs. But in certain uh, times, it's really bad. And one of the biggest problems is plastic bags in the water. Because when it's tens of thousands of plastic bags in the water, it heats up the water. It's holding the, the heat of the water in. The sun's coming through the plastic bag and heating it up. And so they're not getting these sickness. And he said, and if you do this, he said the sicknesses of Egypt will not come upon you, okay? But when, by the time of Jesus, they turned around and Jesus said, you can eat all these things, right? You can eat them, okay? You can eat all these, what were considered unclean animals, okay? But there was a third reason, and the third reason is what, the, we were told um, there's an allegory uh, that we eat the word of God, Right, we put the word of God in us, right? And um, when uh, what you eat, right, in that area, if you keep reading Darwin, you keep reading philosophy, you keep reading all these other things, you will come, right, into error. You're eating wrong things. And all the, you couldn't eat animals that were. Um, uh, fed or carrion, that lived off dead things. That is an allegory. The word of God gives life and uh, the philosophies of this world bring death. Okay? So you weren't to eat of creatures that fed off uh, dead things, right? You were to eat um, certain animals, but if they uh, ate grass and then they brought the grass up, it's called ruminate, if they brought the grass up later and chewed their cud, it's like you get a sermon, they mightn't understand it completely, they go home, 
they think about it, they, God speaks to them about it, and they bring it back up and just go over and over it again, chewing your card. Right, that were the purposes of it. You've heard you've got all these young Christians and they're not going to eat this and they're not going to eat that and so on. That was not the purpose, right? So they were eating the fat, the excess in this world. <laughs> Look at these guys in America. They've got $40 million uh, Learjets and in one family of money preachers, husband and wife have got one each. Right, okay. And this is horrendous. They drive magnificent cars and everything. They're eating the fat. It was to be given to God. God shall supply all your needs, but not all your wants. Yeah. Right? That was the purpose of God doing it. So these guys, they're into themselves. And with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. Now, what does it mean to feed the flock? The weak you have not strengthened. The word of God, as we get it into us, it changes us and makes us stronger and stronger in faith. When we see the word of God operating in our lives or other people's lives, you see it, you're encouraged in your faith. When you see someone, uh, we get, say, Dwayne, right? Dwayne... You just look at him and we, I, I challenge some of his family right to their face. I've said it plenty of times and some of them even cried. I said, look what God has done with Dwayne. Well, look what God has done with Dwayne. He's, uh, he, he's free of his substance abuse. Not only that, he was a little bit scattered. He's now solid in his thinking he was a prisoner to unforgiveness he's free he's his life is just and it that's not that's not my life but i'm strengthened in my faith by seeing it and we don't um strengthen people by telling them how good we are which some of these pastors do right right we strengthen them with the word of god and then it says here the weak you have not strength, nor have you healed those who are sick. How do you, does God heal? It says he sent his word and it healed them. But if they're preaching philosophy and pop psychology and all those things of this world, what we have is no one's getting delivered. No one's being set free, right? And then it says, um, uh, nor, have, nor bound up the broken. Same thing, it's the word of God. Nor brought back what was driven away. What was driven away? This is really, really important because we'll go on to it. I'm going to come back to this, but I wanted to show you this. If you want to break things down, you look up the themes of all these words. And we've got Psalm 23. This is all a pastor has to do. It's about Jesus, right? It's about Jesus, but if you're um, operating as a pastor, you, the same rules. He lays me down in green pastures. The food I'm getting is healthy and good for me. He doesn't lay me down in uh, poison ivy. And he doesn't lay me down in 20% poison ivy and 80% green grass, right? It, it's toxic. And then it says he uh, makes me to lie in, in still water, leaves me be beside still waters. In the Bible, wa all the liquids, all the liquids are uh, allegories to certain aspects of the Holy Spirit. Out of your belly shall f flow rivers of living water. Great outpourings of um, uh, 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 the two rains, the former and the latter rain for growing things. That's talking about um, lots of people coming into the kingdom of God, lots of people returning to God, okay? The former and latter rains. Um, but you also have it when the priest, you know, tips out the water. It's a picture of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Day of Atonement, right? You have... Um, uh, in Haggai, it calls it Jew. The Jew is withheld from heaven, 
right? They were struggling because the dew was withheld from heaven. It's um, the anointing that breaks the yoke, right? That's why they're struggling. So in their lives. So then we have um, uh, uh, oil. Oil was for both anointing and another liquid and also for healing, the healing balm. Okay, and then the other one is the wine was the wine of joy right? All aspects of the Holy Spirit's ministry in our lives. But these people haven't got it because they've separated the Word of God. They might talk about the Spirit this, the Spirit that, but they know nothing. Because if you haven't got the Word of God, you haven't got the Spirit of God. They work in conjunction. They, they're not one, one independent of the other. And then it says here, nor brought back the which was driven away. Okay. Now, this is really important. He then, um, uh, uh, what's he do? He uh, restores my soul. In this world, this present age, the primary, primary focus of a person when they get saved is to have their soul restored by the Word of God. Okay, their fears broken, all these things, uh, uh, weaknesses, you know, breaking free of bondages and things like this, restoring the soul. But there are false teachers trying to make the focus on physical healing, and that was never part of the Christian world. Yes, they prayed for the sick and got, people got healed. Right, they did that, but they proclaimed the gospel first. And they didn't pray for people who have rejected the gospel, right? You've got to be very careful. We get it in India. People come up and say, can you pray for us? They say, you believe it? And they go, no. And you say, have you heard the gospel, you know, church and that? Yeah, I don't want to do it. I'm not praying for you. Walk away. Walk away. Because the, this is the children's bread. Right? It is not. These modern day money preachers, they think they can just throw a suit coat or blow and everyone gets healed. But Jesus went past that man at the front of the temple every day that he went in there. You know, the Peter, James, and John. It, it, Jesus went into the temple all the time and, and went past him. He says, I only do what I, my Father in heaven does. We're teaching kids wrong things right from day one. Pray, let's pray everyone in the hospital gets sick. You've got a person here who turns around and reads that if you pray to St. Jude, you'll get healed, right? And if they got healed, they'd be convinced forever that St. Jude healed them. Same with Muslims, same with magic, same with anything, right? God, they're not true. They're not going to happen. God has appointed a day in which the believers will all be healed. Yes. It's known as the resurrection, you, right? And we're healed forever, right? Okay? Now, we've got here, it says, uh, bound up, nor brought back which was driven away. Now, um, also in Psalm 23... Right? I'll go to the, this other point first. I'll go to John 10. Go, let's go to John 10. And Jesus makes a comparison between the true shepherd and the false shepherd. The false shepherd's going to hell unless they repent. Right? Okay? Full stop. And here we get it. In John 10. Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door. So you go and look up all the different verses to do with sheep, sheepfold, shepherd, like this. Uh, sheepfold by the door, but climbs up from uh, some other way. The same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. But he calls them by name. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, for the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. He will, uh, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. 
Jesus said, uh, most, go down to verse 7, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever uh, came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear him. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and, and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. It's all about his ministry, right? Um, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep. Churches that have really big numbers, a thousand, there's no possible way in the world the pastor knows their name or knows anything about them. Right? It was never to do that. Right? You are in opposition to God's plan to do it. It says you don't go and retrieve that which was lost. These big churches, people go there for five years, they stop going there, the pastor doesn't know whether they're lost, whether they're, you know, it doesn't matter. His is all organisation. That's how he sees it, as organisation, right? Keeping the, uh, the, the services pristine, you know, great singing, on time, uh, you know, latest fads and fashions and things like this. It's not. The good, the good shepherd goes out, he loses one sheep, he knows every person in there and he goes to get them. Now understand this, when a person leaves because they're in rebellion, you only have to challenge them once, right, full stop, okay? Take someone else and say, look, we're both in agreement on this. Let God deal with them. I got a person that um, has given, driven me crazy for nearly 40 years and um, she uh, hassles me, you know, and I'm forever having to chase her up and she just fall away and whatever. She get angry at people. She had a book of accounts on what everyone, every person ever had. If people knew that, you know, I've heard her say it, like she can tell you things that someone did 20 years ago or said to her 20 years ago. That's the way she is. And um, anyway, she's uh, gone to another church, right? And my mate says, you should go around and see her. I said, no, nah, no, 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 no. God gave me long service leave, right? <laughs> right? God gave me long service leave. If she was backslidden, I'd have to go out. But if she's gone to another pastor, that's his problem. I'm taking hold. I've earned it, 40 years of it. I am going to take, if God grants me long service leave, I'm having it. And I tell people when they say it, I said, you tell me why I should try and drag her back from she's in a safe church already. Right? Okay, full stop. It's not going to be my issue. Right? Now, this is the true shepherds and the false shepherds. And people don't want to think about this because they are talking about pastors they've known or gone to churches. And it is woe to them because they don't know everyone in the church. They've left the church and never been visited. I had a mate I brought to the Lord and I was in a big church and we went out and started a new church. He kept going to the big church. And he backslid, and I can tell you right now, he was in that church for a long time, probably seven years, six or seven years, and nobody to this day has gone out to visit him, right? Okay, to visit him, and that, and he's lost. And um, so I, I've seen it firsthand, right? Okay. Now going back to uh, Ezekiel 34, right, and then we'll go back to Jeremiah 23, right? Ezekiel 34. It says here, right, that um, he turns around and says, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. That's the reason why they're scattered. They didn't have someone 
who was concerned about their spiritual welfare. They just wanted to come to church and tithe and enjoy the fellowship, right? This is what they wanted, right? They, uh, they had no shepherd. No one concerned for their eternal welfare. Oh, they all say, oh, yeah, I wish the best for him, but that's not it. Somebody would uh, talk to God and want to and say, God, um, you know, what can I put into a sermon which will deal with an issue, which will deal with an issue. You don't preach the whole sermon on that issue. If someone's got unforgiveness, you don't do a 90-minute you know, minute dialogue on unforgiveness. You only have to give a biblical example, another example, and God speaks to that person. Right, okay. So we got it here. It says, um, so they, uh, oh, sorry, nor sought what which was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. They're not your pawns, right? The flock are not the game of the pastor. You're going here, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. The pastor's job is to uh, get people. The Bible says, teach faithful men who will teach others who will teach others. Okay? That's the way it is. And go into all the world, commanding them and make disciples of all nations, commanding them to do everything I told you. There's not three ways. The leadership's way, the laity's way, and the way to hell. It's one way. Everything's got to be done the same. Now, if people won't run with it, you can't be knocking at someone's door every night, right? Uh, if any, you, got, you guys, a few of you people know Jeff Till. Jeff Till used to come, why? He used to come round to our place. He wanted to know. He wanted to have questions. He didn't just come to my place a lot. He went and saw Keith and he went and saw different people and he spoke with them, right? Okay, someone's phone's on the thing. So that's what God raises them up. This is what kills me in big churches. They think they're discipling people by running a leadership course. A leadership course. <laughs> okay, let's all do the leadership. Week one, leaders do this, this, this. Le week two, leaders do this, this, this. Leaders do week three, and you finish your leadership course. It doesn't work like that. You've got to kill a bear and you've got to kill a lion before you kill Goliath, right? God raises them up. He did not do a course in leadership. What he did do was he was tested in a situation where a bear comes for the sheep and he says, oh, I've got 99 of them. <laughs> Let him have that one. No, he went out and went on the defensive. He went on the defensive and then he did it again with a lion. Right, he killed them and he's ready for Goliath. Okay, so there is no three ways. I had an argument once with a pastor in a church, and I was going to Bible college, and I said, Why don't we teach people the level of theology in a Bible class? Bible class at Bible college, why don't we do that? And that's what it should be done, but they dumb it down. Now, this is what it happens. That teach men, who will teach faithful men, teach others and teach others. What, what happens is this. When a person comes in, say uh, a person was a brand new Christian, and he comes into the church and he hears a sermon on, um, uh, say, predestination. He doesn't understand it all. He's trying to guess that this is his first Sunday or his tenth Sunday. He's getting some of it. And then he asks questions, and somebody who does understand it then explains it to him. I've been in churches where they've, I've had people speak out in churches and say, you've got to make it simpler. No, I don't. If you can't understand it, then ask the people in the church after you leave. Because there is a place for taking a topic from A to Z 
to nail it. According to these, you, if you're only going there a couple of t three times a year, to these people's mind, you teach them A and B, and uh, next year, at the end of the year, you teach them C and D. And then the year after, E and F. You, you don't, that's not how it's done, right? You let the person ask the questions that they didn't understand from the sermon. That's how it works, right? But they play it down. You should hear. Oh, okay. Someone turned on Christian television and they were going to a church and they said, watch this guy preach. And I watched him and came out, hand his pocket like this, really well dressed, turns around and he says, I just want to tell you what God's told me during the week. You know the things he said? Never mentioned a verse, no theology, no nothing. And he tell, talks about his experiences. And the Bible, where's that? The, in the Bible it says, we preach Christ. He's the topic, and Christ crucified. That's the salvation side. We preach him, same topic, Jesus, warning and teaching. They've got jokes and funny stories. I, me and Janet, we had nothing to do one Sunday night recently, so we went to a church in the area. I said, Ellie, what's this church like? She says, look, Dad, you won't like it, but go and see what it's like. We got there and the guy gets up and speaks for 10 minutes about a painting in history past that had been um, uh, destroyed by someone. You know, they scratched it in a uh, museum and everything. And he raised on, and then he talks for 10 minutes, because I'm sitting there <laughs> analysing everything he's saying. I, I, it's not a critical spirit. It, it gives you an example to explain to people what's happened. There's a clock there in this screen, and I can see it. And at 9 hours 50, he got off the subject of this painting. He then went to 22 minutes in his sermon. That's all they preach. I, we asked them what time the service finished, and they said 7.10, exactly, right? Like, how could you have a service that finishes at 7.10 every week? It's just not on, right? You can't do that. But it's so regular. So the sermon, he's got 22 minutes. By the way, the pastor, on an evening evangelistic sermon, spoke for about 9 or 10 minutes on tithing. Right, you know, like the offering and, and just pulling every scripture out of the thing and reasons why you should give your money, right? This is ridiculous. Anyway, the kid gets off and starts talking and then he gives an altar call. No mention of Christ dying for your sins, right? None of this. They just think you say something Christian and then does anyone want to give their life to Jesus. I was at a uh, school. I taught scripture in high school in Sydney for about 10 years, and I did a little bit up here, but it's too restrictive up here. You can't say Jesus is the only way, and you can't mention hell, right? But what happened is um, uh, uh, when we were there, I told the guys, right, I, I told the guys that were there, I turned around and said, we're going to plan this year. I said, how about taking... Um, the commandments, two a week for five weeks. You've got ten weeks with the kids in high school, right? You've got ten weeks. And they're only small classes, ten, ten a class. I said, why don't we do that? And they said, no, Peter, we don't preach the law. We preach Jesus. Oh, mate. I said, these people, every one of these kids, think that fornication is not a sin. Half of them think that abortion's not a sin, yeah. right? What are you talking about? They've got to be convinced that they need a saviour. Yeah. So the law, which is a... Ch this is to the unsaved. You don't preach the law to Christians. We've already been saved, right? Okay, but to the unsaved, it was always a tutor to Christ. The law is perfect converting the soul. That's what it does. It convinces a person of sin. Paul says, when I knew the law, he was self-righteous. He, he, he was fine. He said, by the law, I was, uh, you know, blameless. And then he said, when I saw the law, I really saw it, he said, I died. I died. I needed a saviour, right? And that's, and they don't want to do that. 
And they're talking about coming to Jesus like he's your friend. No, the gospel was never meant. Listen to this. This is the message, simply. John the Baptist, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That was his message. And then he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Then you have the, um, uh, what is it? The, uh, Jesus comes down and says, repent and believe the gospel. Repent first. They yell out to Peter, how can we be saved? Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sin. Repent. Turn from going your own way to going God's way in every area. No, you don't, there's no free rides, free trips. Oh, you've got, you're, you're special in God's eyes. You can see living with your girlfriend. Right? Don't work like that. Right? It doesn't work like that at all. And then even when Paul, Peter, Paul went to um, Athens in the shortened version of his sermons, because those sermons are a lot longer, it says with many more words, you know, Peter spoke to them. Right? They just give the outline. And Paul turns around and says, repent, uh, now God commandeth all men everywhere to repent, right? And you don't get those message. And one friend of mine was in a church and he left, he wanted to leave. His wife held him there for a long time, but he eventually got out. But um, the pastor said, you've got to <laughs> repent of your negativity, of your low self-esteem, of your uh, not shooting for the best in God, and they're talking about prosperity and all these things. You had to repent of that. No, it's repent of anything that transgresses God's law. Full stop. Now, the flock was scattered. The flock was scattered. It is a judgment on the flock. They went for years. Israel went for 1,800 years going from place to place, being haunted down. Christians, you, you see them going to this church, going to that church, going to that church, ended up giving up. I'm not going to any church, right? You've got Christians going to seven-day Adventist uh, groups. I, I've Two people in churches that I went to, two families, ended up in a... Um, well, that's just a three. Three ended up in Jehovah Witnesses. Jehovah Witnesses de denying Jesus, Pentecostals. Right, some of God, because they forget, they stop going to church, they stop going for ten years, and they pray to what God says here to the beasts of the fields. Yet yeah, th that's what they become prey to. Okay, so let's go back to Jeremiah 23, and they're scattered. Now, the cold hard facts is, the remnant of the flock were brought back. The remnant, not everyone. It's, this is a beautiful story that God restores them. But some people got themselves so lost, right, and rejected all attempts by God. All uh, attempts by God and all, what do you call it, um, uh, uh, God sent people in their path and tried to speak to them and reason with them but they wouldn't come back and they get caught up and lost. And the remnant is brought back, it says it both in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel. The prophets are profane. They speak their own mind. They speak... Any person who speaks their own mind are going to get things right. I, people ask me every year, who's going to win the comp from 1971? I said, South. Uh, south, 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 south. But in 2014, I got it right, right? I got all of them wrong, but I got one right. Anyone can do that. I, when we were telling Janet, Janet was telling people about it, and I went and saw, before I was Christian, I had a girlfriend, and, uh, well, a girl I was chasing, actually, and um, she... Uh, took me to see a tarot card reader. And the tarot card reader says, you're going to come into money. Well, everyone comes into money, nearly, because they get inheritances. All you've got to do is live, you know. And we were around 25, 
okay? All you've got to do is live, and in time, your parents will die and you get an inheritance, right? Or a super, or, you know, like this. They're easy things. And s some people, the parents die earlier than expected, and they get the benefit of it. Some people, they didn't. Right? Some people, I remember a kid that uh, complained, an uh, old mate of mine, um, when he was 20, he, to have this property now would be in ex excess of seven or eight million dollars, his father had it. And he would be looking forward in his, uh, you know, late 30s or something of getting some sort of inheritance, even 40s. His dad gambled the whole lot. Right, and he was cranky with his dad. So the, the fortune teller says, for instance, to a person like that, you're going to come into money, it doesn't work. But they don't care. They're only convincing, they only have to convince a few people and they'll become their evangelists when it comes true. And the prophets are profane. They speak their own mind. I, I challenge every one of you to get your finger and go through every prophet of God and this is what he does. He exposes sin. He promises redemption, commands them that judgment is coming, and promises redemption. Not one, dis go, go through it. Micah, go through the lot. Isaiah, all that, judgment is coming. This is the sin. This is proof that your generation is wicked and God's going to work. But then they gave the hope of being restored and redeemed for the individual who responds to it, right? And you've got these prophets, all they can talk about is how great you're going to be, right? I have an incident, a very famous Australian preacher prophesied over my mate, and I knew he was a pedophile, the pastor. Couldn't do anything about it, right? Because... I mean, significant. I didn't know the proof, but I had a, a close friend go and interview, fly all the way to New Zealand to interview the guy. And it happened and came back. And there was about a thousand of us that knew, but we were outside of the Assemblies of God, right? And he was there. And he prophesied over my mate, and he said, you're going to preach before thousands. Okay, before thousands. God doesn't talk like that. He did say to Paul, I've chosen you to stand before kings. But he didn't talk about numbers. Numbers don't move God. If it's two kings, it's correct, right? Okay, that's, that's all it is. Anyway, we had a, a falling out because I told him if this person prophesied over me, it would be the last thing I would ever believe to come true. He got very offended. And he, uh, we had a fight. He didn't want to talk to me anymore, but I, I took a few years talking him up. And finally... Um, it got exposed and made the newspapers and, and he rang me up and he said, you knew about this, didn't you? I said, yes, I knew about it. Even then, he didn't confess until five years later. And this is what he said. He said, Peter, I haven't been 100% um, honest with you. He said, I was at a meeting and this man was there and he kept staring at me. And he's an old guy <laughs> and this guy's in his late 30s and he said... Anyway, he comes over, no one was on our table, sits next to me, he says, I can't take my eyes off you all night. And he realised that my friend was very uncomfortable with that statement. And he had to get our claws. And he said, I cannot believe the anointing that's sitting on your, you tonight. I, 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 God's told me to tell you you're going to preach before thousands. That was his get out for hitting on a homosexual hit on my friend. It took him a lot of years, a lot of years. See, my friend's gut feeling was like any of us, this guy's off the wall, right? This guy's off the wall. And, but the prophecy, you're going to preach before thousands. And that was the sedative, right? Not to speak about it. And, and he buried it until the end. Now, um, we go on to the dreamers. Now, let's have a look at the prophets. And we go to Jeremiah. We go to Jeremiah 23. And um, uh, it says here, the prophets, it says, For the land is, go to 10, for the land is full of adulterers, 
because he's just raised the subject, uh, the prophets in nine. Uh, for because and for because of a curse, the land mourns. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up. Right, their course, of, their course of of life is evil, and their might is not right. For both prophet and priest are profane. Yes, in my house I have found their wickedness, says the Lord. Therefore their ways shall be to them like slippery ways. In the darkness they shall be driven on and, and fall in them, for I will bring disaster on them the year of their punishment. I have seen folly in the, the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied by Baal and caused my people Israel to err. Also I've seen a horrible thing in the prophets of Jerusalem. They commit adultery and walk in lies. When you see ministers... When you see ministers falling in adultery, we are in those days. It is impossible to go into idolatry. It is impossible to prophesy by Baal and not go into, uh, not to go into adultery. We had a, a guy in New Zealand. He got uh, head of a denomination in New Zealand. He got caught. The paper said he slept with 20. My mate put it into a newspaper and into a magazine and uh, he wrote my friend and said get your facts right mate it was closer to 10 than it was 20 so it was obviously 14 right because at 15 it swaps over right if it was 11 he would have said 11 right okay closer to 10 and I just picked up the papers the other day and uh, I wanted to find a church for my friends and they live down in just over the border and I read about a pastor who got caught with three women, right? And then um, you have another organisation, a church in Australia, another famous pastor who's been married multiple times, been caught in adultery multiple times. And I had a Bible study of people who no longer went to church and they were with him for a really long time. And the woman in the company of everyone else there, and they're all 80s and some were 90s and all this, and she said, I know six women who slept with him. And I said, what were you doing staying at the church? Once, and I'm out. If they don't get rid of him, I'm out. Yeah. Full stop. Right? End of story. And she, that's six that she knows. There'd be ones that she doesn't know about. And because it was a massive church. And there's also the places he stays at. Right? You cannot stop it. I... Adultery and idolatry are identical. You're supposed to have one lover, right? That, that's the marriage. You're supposed to have one lover. That's got Jesus. That's the Christian life. But if you're doing Darwin and you're doing uh, Republican, uh, uh, you know, politics or Democrat politics or whatever... You, there are issues Christians have to stand on, but we don't align with any political party, full stop. We have to challenge and speak out as much as we hate the error in the other party, whatever party we believe in, we have to expose errors. We, ha we don't get silent on it, right, full stop. And then it becomes a judgment issue. So what we have is... This is the state, and it says here, but there's something really important here. It says, um, therefore, that says the Lord, the prophets, hang on. Um, uh, verse 16, thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. He's talking to the believer. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. They continually say to those who despise me, the unbeliever, the Lord has said, you shall have peace. No one can have peace without the Prince of Peace, without Jesus. And then it says here, and to everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, this is people who are more deliberate, they might know about God, they might be backsliders, no evil shall come upon you. Oh, yes, he will. God judges all the time all the time and then it says here uh, verse 21 I have not sent these prophets yet they ran I've not spoken to them yet they prophesied but if they stood in my counsel and heard my 
uh, and cause my people to hear my words, then they would have turned away from their evil way and from the evil of their own doings. Now go, let's go down to this next one. It says, verse 29, I have heard what the prophets have said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of their, the seed of their own heart, who try to make my people forget my name. Now, in the Jewish world, they've forgotten how to say Yahweh, right? They don't know the name. Right? In our world, everyone knows Jesus' name. Everyone knows it, right? But Jesus has another name. It's called the Word of God. And these people elevate their dreams over the Word of God. You know, there was a guy called Rick Joyner, and I think he's still alive, and he wrote a book about his big dream, and it's nonsense. It's just absolutely and utterly nonsense. And, um, and people, he's trying to do theology from his dream, right? We go to the word of God, we don't do it. Now look what God says. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he who has my word, it's a contrast, let him speak my word faithfully, for what is the chaff to the wheat? The rubbish to the real, Okay? is not my word like a fire. I told people the other day, I do not want, if a person says something funny, it's funny. You only have to get me tired and I'll make a joke, right? Because <laughs> it, it just is natural. Jenna says I get stupid when I, you know, get tired or, you know, burning out on the um, diabetes or whatever. That's what uh, Janet says, he's got to the silly stage. I don't mind people cracking a joke, but, but that's not what it's about. It's not about entertainment. It's about getting the word of God, explaining it so we can understand and see the purpose of God in it. And I said, I go to church. You know what a good sermon is for me? Uh, it's not new information. A lot of people transfer new information to a good sermon. It's I stand there. And in the middle of that sermon, it could be just an average sermon, but a person who is sincere with God and has heard from God and he says something and it cracks you. That's me. Sorry, God. That is a good sermon, right? He says, is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces, right? That's what God... Uh, you know, I expect it to pick and to challenge me and to change me and to transform me, his word, to fall on the grace of God. That's what is a good sermon, not uh, someone who can articulate speaker, not a person who knows a lot, but somebody who can hit, hit me with a sermon. Okay, now, there's just one final state. The dreamers... I left out one other people. Our response to the dreamers. Now, this is very hard to read. You have to go home and do it yourself slowly, but we'll just go through it. He says, so when these people, or the prophet or the priest, ask you, saying, what is the oracle of the Lord? You shall say to them, what oracle? When someone is undoubtedly not speaking from God, it's not about winning friends and influencing people, right? It says, what oracle? You tell them, I will even forsake you, says the Lord. And as for the prophet and the priest and the people who say the oracle of the Lord, I will even punish that man and his house. Thus, every one of you shall say to his neighbor and every one to his brother, what has the Lord answered and what has the Lord spoken? And the oracle of the Lord you shall mention no more. You won't say that. You won't agree with them. Oh, yeah, it's great. Great what you say when it's a lot of nonsense, right? For every man's word will be his oracle, for you have perverted the words of the living God, the Lord of hosts, our God. Thus you shall say to the prophet, what has the Lord answered you? Right? That's rubbish. Right? That is rubbish. Now, you don't do it for everything. Right? Like if someone just said, 
um, uh, you know, new convert says, oh, I think um, Jesus would come uh, before the trib- uh, before, um, sorry, the seven-year covenant. You mightn't believe that. You don't attack a new Christian. But when someone gets up and says something that has to be judged, when we've got a person coming to a fellowship that I go to and he, he, uh, he's tell- trying to tell us that we have to keep the Sabbath. And you tolerate it for a little while and you just watch him and watch him and then you start putting sermons and start clarifying this on what it is. You have to challenge it. You don't let it go. Therefore, thus says the Lord, because you say the word, the oracle of the Lord, God says, and I have sent to you saying, do not say the oracle of the Lord. Therefore, behold, I even I will utterly forget you and forsake you. This is, this is if you go along with them, even though you don't believe it, you just publicly go along with them. It says here, will utterly forget you and forsake you and the city that I gave you and your fathers, and I'll cast you out of my presence, and I'll bring an everlasting reproach unto you and a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. Right? And this, is, this issue, your children are watching you all the time. So if you compromise, they see you and they watch you, you have shown them a pathway. You have shown them a pathway. Anyway, we, uh, we will stop there and we'll have a quick eat or whatever and then we'll come back and we'll just do a little bit more. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there were ten plagues and the first three plagues, right, were everyone copped it, whether you were Jew or whether you are Egyptian. Right? Now, with that um, plagues, one of them is the three frogs. Now, we have an undeniable principle that the Old Testament explains new, uh, old te- uh, sorry, New Testament explains Old Testament uh, examples and typologies, symbols and all that. So we, we go to the New Testament and try to find out what the frogs are. We are told in Revelation 9 that in Revelation 9, it says here, hold on, is it 9, the frogs? Oh. oh, I just can't think where it is. Okay, but I'll just explain it. I can't see it in nine, but I always thought it was in nine. Okay. Where is it? Come on. Yeah, three frogs. Where's that from? Oh, is it? In 13. Sorry about this. I relied on my own memory. No, it's not in there, right? And, and it talks about the frogs. Now, the frogs, we're told in the New Testament, are the, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, right? If that is the same as the typology, that means believers saw the Antichrist, right? That's very, very important, okay? Then we go to Revelation chapter 10, And it says, And I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of of fire. He had a little book open his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and cried with a loud voice as as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered his voice. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voice, I was about to write, but he says, don't write anymore. The angel I saw, okay, uh, then he goes on, I'm just going to go on to this, where it turns around and he says, um, the mystery of God, okay. Sorry about this. Verse seven. Verse seven, is it? 
Yeah, the angel was all standing on the sea and swore to him who lives forever and ever and who created heaven and earth and things in it, the earth and seas. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all die, right? That is the resurrection. But here, it's at the seventh angel, okay? It's at the seventh angel. And so, um, if you then look at the verses that talk about, say, uh, Revelation chapter 6, right? If you see this, it says here um, in Revelation 6, um, Well, look, I'm just so tired. Okay, um, my mind's blocking up. But uh, you'll, you'll know the verses. It turns around and says, now is the time to reward your servants. When the resurrection takes place, that's the great, that is the reward, right? Okay, you're going to be... Uh, eternal in the presence of God forever, right? But it's also when God will give the uh, judgment seat of Christ, right? When we go up and the judgment seat of Christ takes place, okay? So what happens is um, all, if you do a study on all the things that happen between the sixth and seventh seal and the sixth and seventh trumpet, they're identical, and they're all to do with the rapture, okay? Now, right now, um, what's happening is, if you want to study the resurrection and know it for yourselves, you just learn these topics, the last day. You have to know what happens on the last day, and you have to put the potentials of the last day. Is it the literal last day, right, okay? If, um, then uh, the wrath must come after Christ returns to the earth, right? Which is not, right? It happens beforehand, okay? You're already, uh, the wrath is happening in Revelation uh, 16, 17 onwards. The wrath is happening in Revelation 8. The wrath is happening in Revelation 16. The wrath is happening before Christ comes to the earth. The people who take that last day, many of them are kingdom now, and they don't even believe in a, a two-part resurrection, one in the air and one when he returns, right? But the, and then you were saying, if it didn't happen after Christ returns, physically returns, the wrath happens before, and the Christians have to go through it. And there's no, that's not true. The, the blessed hope is that we would be spared of the wrath. We are not appointed to wrath, but salvation through Jesus Christ, okay? You do the last day. You do the shut book, uh, shut a door, the shut gate. Same thing, right? You go through every verse of it, right, in the Bible. You look it up and you answer the questions like, does anyone get in after the door is shut? And how are you going to fit that into your uh, view on the, on the rapture? You have to, and it was an Old Testament principle too. You look up the last, it turns around and says, uh, I, I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know that at the last I will, uh, the, he will stand on the earth and I will see him in my flesh. It was always the last. Some people, good teachers, have said the rapture could have happened at any time beforehand. It doesn't even have to happen to begin the last seven years. That's nonsense. It was always going to be the last. And you look at Daniel chapter 12. You look at Daniel chapter 12 here and listen to what he says to Daniel. Uh, go your way. But you go your way till the end. For you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Right? This is when it was always going to happen at the end. But where it happens in that seven-year period, you've got to know it. And as I said, I've got Pentecostal pastors asking me, are we in the, where are we in the last seven years? I said, it hasn't started. It hasn't started. They are seeing the cycles happen 
You'll get more earthquakes, but the real earthquakes happen in the last three and a half years. All right? That's when the biggest earthquake that the world has ever seen or will ever see, that's when that happens. Right? You, you will see uh, famines in different countries. You'll see things going on. We're having a run at the moment with people thinking this jab is the mark of the beast. And you just go, it's not the mark of the beast. It's gigantic. I'm talking, I'm talking pastors and the nonsense. And I can't even answer them on Facebook because they get offended. You'd have, uh, my job is to change their view. So I'll talk to them privately. I'll get, let a little bit of time go so that, you know, their fighting's over. But they're doing it. Jab. Th they see it as this. No jab, no job. No jab, no school. No jab, no um, uh, university. In America, all the top universities, you've got to have your jab and people aren't going to do it. Right? It's excluding you from your income and all these things. But it's not what it says. Right? It's not it. Right? Because it can't happen until... <laughs> it can't happen until there's a seven-year covenant. Now, I've got to be honest. Uh, when what uh, Trump did with Netanyahu and got all the Arabs to join up, right, that it was heading that way, right? Because, understand this, that seven-year covenant has to be seven years of 360 days, not 365. What world would do that now? But there's two groups of people who still use the three-six of the lunar calendar year. That's the Jews and the Arabs. And it was, it was hanging there. It was going there. But they, there was no time frame to it. But they're seeing the cycles. Everything. This jab is dividing people in the church. You've got people in the church say, you're not taking this jab. You have no love for the rest of Australians. And they, you go, no. I, ten years ago, my doctor said to me, are you going to take the flu jab? No. Nah. You going to take it next year? No. Nah. Next year, no. Nah. And it comes to the tenth year, COVID-19, you going to take the flu shot? No. Nah. And people say, now. They wouldn't say it ten years ago. Now listen to this. Go and look at these facts. In 19... Uh, 2019, from January 1 to January, uh, January 1 to January, uh, uh, to October 3, nine months, 191 people in nine months in Queensland died of the flu. Go and look at our statistics. We've got seven dead in the whole time of COVID. Right, seven dead, right? North Rhine Westphalen is one, uh, three and a half times bigger than Queensland in population. They have uh, three and a half times, so they should have about 25 deaths, double it, 50. Multiply by 10, 500. No. The, the last look was 15,800 dead, right? Now, we, we've got some answers here. There's got to be answers. Either, now the Darwinists used to say that, um, uh, the Darwinists used to say that, Charles Darwin himself, that the English were the top of the, top of the evolutionary tree. The Germans said the Aryans were the top of the evolutionary tree. Is it now Queenslanders at the top of the, the <laughs> at, at, right? Because for every North, that's right, yeah. But this is what it is, right? As North Rhine Westphalen, for every Aus Queenslander that gets COVID 19, two and a half thousand, more than two and a half thousand um, North Rhine Westphalen people will die. So, that ridiculous postulation, we cross it out. There's only two left. One is their techniques of dealing with it. They've had draconian laws for the whole period of time, like Melbourne had. Melbourne's had 800, you know, plus deaths. We've had the, the least, you know, restrictions. 
we get out in the sun, we get vitamin D, we do all this, and we've survived healthier. That is an option. The other one is sinister, that the 14,800 is not people who died of COVID, but people who died with COVID. Yeah. Your head's hanging off in a car accident, they've got to test you to see that you are, uh, don't have COVID because it'll spread. And in America, all hospitals were given more money if you had COVID because they, you have to take bigger precautions to uh, isolate the, the dead people. Something's wrong here. Some don't tell a rat. I don't know the answer, right? Could be a combination of both. But, um, but when New South Wales beat Queensland in the state of origin this year, we can't, that'll finalise the thing about Queenslanders being at the top of the tree, right? But this is where people, the Illuminatis, the people that are coming out, the statements that are saying, I don't, the net is rife. I don't even read it. It's just banged at me from Christians I know. The majority of people on my Facebook are undoubtedly Christian. And they want me to, I get, you know that one where they speak directly to you, right? We're going to come in. Directly to you you know, on Facebook, and I do it, see this video, see this video, and they want me to comment on it, and it's bizarre stuff, right? You know, it's absolutely and utterly bizarre, right? And this is where it's at. Everyone, we've got to challenge people right back to start from scratch and learn premillennialism, then learn the, uh, the timing of the wrath. You've got to take time, go shortcuts, know anyone, go and study those topics yourself, right? Go and study the night. Everything you can find in the Bible on the night, every sentence and think about it. Take months to do it. No shortcuts, right? No picking up tapes of other people. You can listen to tapes of other people after you've formed your opinion to see, to match up, to say, oh, I might have been wrong on this, or no, he's wrong on that, right? And this is why, right? We, um, end times prophecy right now, God has dished up to us. The Christians before got hammered with evolution. Right now they strike back. The Christians before got hammered about prophecy. Now the ball's in our court. Now the ball's in all court, our courts, coming true right before us. But if you mix it with nonsense, the Christian says, oh, you're half a dozen right, half a dozen wrong, you're the same as the local witch, right? And that's what they are, right? You say nonsense. So I just wanted to do this thing, that to look at this rapture, and to look at it, study the sixth and seventh seal, the sixth and seventh trumpet, Go and look at uh, the one where in Exodus. Go look at a Revelation um, 10, right? And the mystery of God is finished. That's when the rapture is in the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet. Even the seven thunders are a picture of the seven trumpets, right? The, the tr go back in the whole Old Testament. Thunder was a, uh, an allegory of, or a symbol of coming judgment, right? Severe judgment. You have it here. It's the same thing. It's seven sounds, seven sounds. You've got a thing in, Ezekiel, uh, in Daniel chapter 2 and 7, a statue and four beasts, but they tell the same story. But they, they, they are, they're identical, right? And so you have the two stories. You have the seven thunders, you have the seven trumpets. As I said before when I was last here, I think I did, it was last year, I said the last trumpet can be the last of a set. It cannot, you cannot have the last trumpet which brings a resurrection and have seven more trumpets after it. English doesn't allow for that. 
right? It, it just, the language doesn't allow for that, right? You can have the last there, the last of a set. I believe it's the last of a set, and I don't even believe that it is the last trumpet, saying the last of the set, because there's a trumpet when everyone, when Christ returns, there is that jubilee trumpet as we go into the kingdom. The, the silver, not the normal shofar, the jubilee ones, the, um, yeah, silver trumpets. Anyway, we've got to get going, so thanks for... Thank you.